Hello and welcome to all the Hillians out there. I'm Joe here from my co-host Dan. Hello and greetings. And today we have yet another Hyrule in Focus video for you all. Funny how this is one of our newer playlists, but it's already gotten pretty popular, so that's good. Thank you guys very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Here we go. We're going to continue our analysis of A Link to the Past. Last time we discussed how Zelda sent a message to both Link and her the uncle, Oji-san, the two both tried to venture into the castle. What we kind of skipped over was that outside it is storming. This is more to set the mood on Nintendo's part. But let's be honest. Let's actually think about the fact that they put, implemented a storm feature for this part of the game. It's only this part of the game, but the very fact that they implemented lightning, such great visuals on the SNES for such a short period of time, it's just incredible. It, this is, visually it looks great. There's a reason why this was something big back when it first came out. The trouble is, Link is trying to slip into the castle. He ends up stumbling down into a hole, seemingly by accident. It begs the question, is he Jar Jar or Link, given clumsiness? I'm joking, I'm joking. But in all seriousness, the clumsy feature here, I think is, or at least, you know, he's supposed to pick up. For the fans, I think it's just supposed to be, yeah, you just do that. I don't think there's too many who give it much thought or get into it too deeply. But the reality is that this was not done simply by accident or on a whim by Nintendo. I think we should also look at it in terms of characterization. And in terms of characterization, it does show Link as being fairly clumsy starting out. The thing about Link possibly being clumsy early on is that I think it's supposed to symbolize beginning of all heroes' journeys, all young men feel clumsy and inadequate. So we have to see here visually a slightly clumsier Link, a more youthful Link, before at the end of the game he's graceful and cutting down again to size. And it's very important that we do see a bit of characterization with Link. I always wondered, how did he know the grass there was hollow? And it wasn't until I was an adult that I found out, oh no, no, that's supposed to be like that Japanese anime humor of the hero stumbling into things. In the hero's journey, the hero will often stumble into the adventure. He doesn't always just ride into the adventure willingly or gracefully. He'll often stumble in by accident. This accidental side of things, the nature of that life is pretty random and that the fates may have one plan for us and we have another but we'll often stumble down the path that we may not have wanted or expected for ourselves and this is what happens to link clearly he probably didn't want to succeed his uncle so soon but he was meant to because it's the hero's journey he has to set off out of the home out of his realm of comfort out into the wilderness this is the nature of the hero's journey he stumbles down the hole and finds a small pool so he's very lucky he didn't stumble down to his doom him trailing after his uncle after leaving the house what i think is that he saw his uncle disappear he went to investigate and trip down he followed because he was impulsive there's the consciousness that his uncle is pretty old we could read into it that link wanted to prove himself he's an impulsive youth who wants to prove himself worthy and a man the trouble is that the need to prove oneself a man is something more symbolic of boys than of men though men sometimes do need to prove that they are men, but that's only in the context that they can take care of those around them, which is more reminiscent in some ways of the warrior archetype or even the lover archetype. With Link, he is clearly the warrior archetype. He needs to set out on a hero's journey, but that doesn't necessarily mean he should feel such a strong urge to be Kuwabara. He needs to stumble and make mistakes. That said, once he falls down into that hidden tunnel, it's not long before he discovers his uncle is dying. In the comic book, the uncle is wounded in battle by Aghanim. I always kind of regard it as canon. That said, the uncle in the game does not divulge much information. He just gives a basic instruction and tutorial on how to use the sword, at least a written one. He admits he did not want to include Link, with Link being keen to carry on the old man's wishes. Passing of the torch. Yeah, yeah, very much so. This is one of the few moments in a Zelda game where you have a passing of the torch, from what I've observed. Most of the games, Link doesn't really get a mentor per se. He might get one later, but he has to set out on the adventure. He doesn't have an uncle or father figure in most of the games, from what I've seen. That said, in Ocarina of Time, I guess you could say Deku Tree was a bit of a father figure. In that case, you do have a bit of a passing of the torch, though I don't know if the Deku Tree would appreciate that kind of description. It's like a trial by fire. Yes, in a forest, in the case of the Great Deku Tree. Okay, I, I gotta drop the tree jokes. 
Link sets out down these tunnels, discovering that the guards have all been possessed. What's interesting about the possession is that the guards still seem able to semi-strategize. They're just turned into brigands and just absolutely insane and wanting to slaughter anyone who tries to defy Aghanim and Ganon. On the one hand, we could look at this as them being, if one were to kind of analyze them as a group, as being fairly foolish of a weak will to quote Star Wars. But I would also venture so far as to say that it doesn't matter who sits the throne so long as someone sits the throne and tells them what to do. There's a deliberate attempt not to think and just follow the pack. This I've observed is all too common in life and it is something that what's funny for me is that a lot of people say well I don't follow the group then they follow the group which is in itself pretty funny. I think it's a form of denial. We all follow groups in some form. There's no real shame in it to an extent unless the group is behaving really foolishly. The guards are under possession, but if you look at that as a bit of an allegory for how their group operates, they were not a very loyal bunch by betraying the king to an extent in the way that they do. On the other hand, you could also look at it just as magical possession. That's fine. It does make for an interesting reading of the text. But what that shows is Aghanim's great power because he's able to mold the minds of thousands of guards to his will and direct them like they're all marionettes. This ability of his is pretty impressive. It does show Aghanim to be a force to be reckoned with. He is far beyond what an ordinary person can fight against. What he should have feared was Link more than anything else. That aside, he did not know Link was coming along, and he did not know that the spirit of the hero still burnt strong in Hyrule. Neither did Ganon. That being said, let's also hearken back to one thing. Link does not know his way around the passages. His uncle probably knew them better because his uncle did not stumble into this passage by accident. He knew his way in. Link did not. Link followed his uncle then fell headlong into the adventure. But once he's down in those tunnels, you're down in the tunnels like the those below Paris, the catacombs. Imagine being down there and having nothing but the suffocating darkness all around you, except for the odd torch that this guard or that one that has, and knowing that discovery means death. That would be indeed quite the scary situation. I wouldn't blame the staunches of men to hesitate. And, or to crack. Exactly. But Link doesn't even so much as hesitate. That speaks to the amount of courage and strength he has. Even in the comic, he doesn't really hesitate too much. That is an incredible thing about Link. He is the embodiment of courage and of willpower. Because much as we say courage, we should also bear in mind that I think the Japanese are also thinking of the notions of valor and will. That is to say, courage and will are often interlinked, of course. The French have a term called volonté, which is to say a kind of courage and willpower melded into one. When you include the notion of valor, valeur, that is to say honor mixed with courage, Link does have that. So the Triforce of Courage, the ideal there is that it embodies all these virtues and Link is the physical embodiment of them. And for a generation of people, a Link to the Past Link was the definitive Link for a time, at least until Ocarina of Time. So his courage, his willingness to go into that suffocating darkness, into those catacombs, was a bit of a superheroic act. Now in the first room, Link comes across two guards skulking about and quickly takes them out. It's pretty cool how in the game they're not very hard to take out. So the game is literally teaching you room by room a bit of a tutorial how to play the game. You're getting a baptism in fire so to speak, a lesson in real time on how to play this game. And that's really interesting. You have to pay attention. Link is also in game going through this. He's getting a baptism in fire. He's having to do this in real time just as you the player have to. Your kind of partners with is in the narrative. That aside, Link ends up battling those two goons, getting, for his trouble, a few rupees. This is, I think, meant more as encouragement for the player, like, yay, look at what you won, yay, yippee for you. Rather than having you continue down through those catacombs, the game takes you out of them, so that Link has to barge in through the front door into the palace, which I just love that. I just love that, oh, I, I could try to sneak around, although I am already in my hero's outfit. So I guess I'll just barge in for the front door. And we could clearly tell that this was a, an emergency escape route for the royal family. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was. Link deciding to take the fight through the front door. The mentality, I'm not gonna be underhanded. I'm not going to fight my way through life through back doors and tunnels and compromise my morals in myself, I'm gonna go in for the front door. I'm open and honest. 
I'm going in from the front. People may say that's foolish, but on the other hand, it's a matter of not compromising yourself. You do have to compromise in life, but this is a matter of where he's not gonna compromise his honor and his values. And he's going to do the right thing no matter what. Anyways, tell us what you think of us getting linked past the front door and into the palace itself. I know we're going very slow, but that's the idea behind this podcast. So next time we're going to get all the way up to the liberation of Zelda, her getting out of the palace. We're going to cover the entire palace in one swing. Then we're going to get into the next part of the story. So if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to smash that like and that subscribe button as though you were Link putting an end to Ganon.